Hi, and welcome to this episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. I am your host, Eric Bjornstad. I am your guide through the ever-changing world of fuel. This is a podcast for anyone who uses fuel or who has things that use fuel, whether that's at work or at home, and it's for both consumers and for professional people who work in jobs and in uh, professional positions where one of the things that they may have to do is they may have to manage fuel so that it can be used in some capacity to get the job done. That means the Fuel Pulse Show podcast is for everyone. So what are we going to talk about on today's episode? Well, we have done some episodes in the past of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast talking about common problems in fuel that users face. And we called out that the biggest problem facing professionals and businesses who have to work with stored fuel is keeping microbial contamination under control. Now, because of the way that fuels have changed in recent decades, it is easier than ever for microbial contamination to develop in storage tanks. And when that happens, it brings serious problems with it. See, today's fuels are much less resistant to microbes than they used to be, mainly because of the removal of sulfur to create the ultra-low sulfur diesel that we have today. And that's all as a result of uh, complying with government mandates from things like the Clean Air Act. Now, when the sulfur was in diesel fuel, it didn't kill, it didn't retard microbes, but when you remove the sulfur, it makes today's diesel fuels more attractive for water, with, or what they say, more hygroscopic, and microbes like water, they need water. Well, now you have fuel that's more attractive for to or, or tends to attract more water is what I was saying. So that makes it more hospitable for microbes. And then another thing is that today's fuels also have lower what they call aromatic content. Aromatics are a kind of molecules that exist naturally in petroleum and uh, microbes don't like to be around them. Uh, microbes like to be around the other kinds of molecules called aliphatics. Well, one of the things they did when they were uh, trying to clean the fuel up, so to speak, is they put a cap or lowered the cap on the percentage of aromatic molecules that could be in diesel fuel trying to reduce the emissions. Well, one of the effects that it had was you now have fewer of the micro uh, the molecules that microbes don't like more of the molecules that they do like. And so reducing the amount of aromatics in the composition of diesel fuel means you make it easier for microbes to grow in that fuel. Then you throw in the pretty much nationwide use of biodiesel, which microbes love. And what we have is we have a situation where there are thousands upon thousands of fuel storage tanks across the country all filled with ultra-low sulfur diesel fuel that has very little inherent resistance to the constant microbial assaults that they face. So it is only a matter of time before any fuel storage tank develops microbial contamination. Uh, microbial contamination also tends to develop in between periods of, here in along the coast and in the south, in between periods of hurricane activity. See, because of, well, just because of basic human psychology, we tend to check on things. We tend to check our fuels when there's the urgency of a an event like a hurricane coming on the horizon, when there's an impending or a potential disaster that's on the horizon that we have to prepare for. Then we try to make sure that we have everything we need, and that includes checking the stored fuels that maybe we're going to use for emergency backup systems. The, the, the impending hurricane... Uh, creates the urgency, and we know that we better make sure that the fuel is still good in case that we have to use it. When times are peaceful in that regard, when nothing's going on, when we don't have that urgency of a disaster being on the view of the horizon, then we don't check our fuel unless we have some kind of regulation that makes us do it whether we want to or not. So there are lots of areas in the country also that don't have to deal with hurricanes. You know, people in Nebraska and Oklahoma don't have to deal with hurricanes. They have to deal with other things. 
Um, so put all this stuff together, and what we have in this country is a situation where we have hundreds of thousands of fuel storage tanks where it's entirely possible that a great many of them have microbial contamination situations developing inside of them as we speak. So the point of what we want to talk about in this episode is, what do you do if you have a storage tank that has microbial contamination? And what we'll try to do, what, or what we'll try to go through in this episode are all of the considerations entailed in answering that question. We'll talk about what are the symptoms of microbial contamination that people look for? How do you know for sure if you've got a microbial problem? What happens if you miss the signs and the contamination continues to progress? What can you expect to happen then? What are the recommended steps for knocking out a microbial problem once you confirm or think that you really do have one? And how do you know if the problem has been solved? So we're going to talk about all that on this episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. So let's start. How do you verify that you have microbial contamination in the first place? Well, traditionally, people have used uh, what we'll call secondary signs. Secondary signs that point to symptoms of a microbial problem. They've done it this way because they haven't had a better way of doing it. Um, they haven't had a more a way that gives them a more definitive answer, so they have to roll with what they've got, so to speak. So traditionally, people have tried to pay attention to the outward signs that something was going on in the fuel or in the tank. First, what are these signs? Well, first, they would look for changes in the fuel's condition, as in changes in color, changes in smell. That's because as microbes grow, as they proliferate, they make microbial byproducts that cause reactions in the fuel that degrade it. They form gums and varnishes. They change the fuel's color. The fuel starts to darken as it grows unstable and it stratifies. Uh, the fuel stability is reduced and you have a noticeable change in the appearance and the color of the fuel. Uh, the fuel will be darkened. It will be darker than normal. Uh, they would also look for change in odor of the fuel. Uh, odor is a sign that microbes are consuming fuel components and producing sulfur gases as a byproduct of that, which you can smell. Uh, people who manage fuel know what good clean fuel is supposed to smell like, good clean diesel, good clean gas. And so if they pull a sample all they have to do is look at the appearance and they can smell it and they can tell if there's a difference. And if there's a difference simply in these physical characteristics, that's a sign that something's going on that they need to look closer at. Another sign for fuel dispensing situations, an outward sign of microbial presence inside the tank is a reduction in fuel flow. A gas station might normally have a flow of, let's say, 10 to 12 gallons per minute coming from their pump dispensers. Uh, but a microbial contamination problem can reduce that flow down to 3 to 5 gallons per minute. Uh, if you have a truck stop, uh, their systems might dispense 30 gallons per minute. So if, they're, if they notice that their flow is slowing and it slows down to, let's say, down to 15, about half of that, that would be a similar sign. All of these things are signs that there is something going on because this kind of flow disruption does not just happen on its own. It has to be a result of something causing it. In this case, it can be a result of clogged fuel lines and clogged fuel filters, both of which are strongly linked to microbial activity. Now, speaking of filters, reduction of filter life is something that they would pay attention to. See, usually, uh, if they have to reduce, when filters have to be replaced, there's a, a typical lifespan that a filter will have. But if they find that filters have to be replaced more often than, let's say, every six months, it's a, again, it's a sign that something may be going on. And if something is suspected with the filters, what many times what they may do is they may pull the filter and they may cut it open. 
and then they'll look inside because they want to see what the filter is catching. And if they look inside, they might see evidence of rag layer uh, uh, from the tank being caught in the filter. Um, they may find things like an uneven distribution of coating inside. They may find uh, that some of the interior metal filter parts have been corroded. Uh, they may also find what they call leopard spotting. That's a, it's a very characteristic visual sign. Leopard spotting inside water coalescing filters. Uh, so many times if they cut the filter open, they look inside, they see evidence of what, what's going on in the tank will show up in the filters, what we're trying to say. And if they see these kinds of things, those are all indicators of possible microbial activity in the tank or the system that the filter happens to service. So they definitely pay attention to filters. But this concept of reduced component life also applies to other parts of the distribution system, to the valves, the rubber seals, the hoses. All of these can be degraded if there's a microbial contamination situation going on. Each of these things, rubber seals, hoses, they all have typical lifespans. If their lifespan starts becoming shorter, it's a sign that there's something in the system uh, probably something microbial that isn't supposed to be there and which is causing damage to these parts. And then beyond the filters and the tank components, uh, if they've noticed that there's anything unusual happening with the things that use the fuel, which means the engines and the vehicles that get their fuel from that tank. It could be things like exhaust issues and performance issues with the vehicles. It could be plugged fuel filters in the vehicles. Those kinds of things can be signs either that the fuel itself has degraded and isn't functioning properly, or a sign that part of the microbial contamination that was in the storage tank has now been transferred over into the vehicle and is cause, is developing and causing problems in the vehicle. So those are a few of these kinds of things that traditionally operations management have looked for. They traditionally paid attention to try to look out for these kinds of things. But the commonality with all of those things is they're all outward symptoms. And the problem with relying on looking for symptoms to know that there's a problem happening. The problem with looking for symptoms is that in many cases, by the time the symptom is serious enough to be noticeable to the outside observer, the problem inside has already progressed to a pretty serious stage. So now that we recognize or know about some of these symptoms, how long, we might ask the question, how long does it take for these kind of microbial problems to develop? Uh, how long does it take for, let's say, for microbial biomass to be produced in enough quantity that it plugs tank filters and fuel lines, for example? Now, the most correct answer for that kind of question is it depends. And it depends because each situation is a little different. Now, a little bit later, we're going to talk about the fact that each system has its own what we call a control interval. Uh, a control interval that speaks to not only how long it takes for microbial contamination of a certain level to appear in that system, or in other words, if you start from zero, you start from clean, how long would you expect for moderate microbial growth to appear, followed by how long after that would it take for that uh, contamination to expand and develop to a serious level. Each system's a little bit different, and each system, the length of time that it takes for any of these things to happen in a system is called a control interval. And we'll talk about that. So when we say, well, how long does it take? How long would we expect to allow for uh, uh, fuel filters to be plugged by microbial growth? Well, it depends. Depends on the control interval for that system. It also depends on how long it takes for specific problems related to microbial contamination to manifest themselves in these different systems. What we mean by that is that because each system is a little bit different, um, it may take differing amount of times, not only for a microbial contamination to grow from zero to 100, but also for 
these outward symptoms to start appearing uh, because each system is a little bit differently. Um, however, that answer is not as helpful as we might like it to be. And so we can try to answer this question generally. And the answer, uh, the generalized answer, so to speak, is going to be different for different problems. Usually, if you're talking about how long does it take for microbial contamination to develop enough to change the fuel's physical properties, well, that can be a few months for that to happen. Um, for other types of problems, like for corrosion of certain tank, metal tank components, that can happen within, let's say, a year. It really depends on uh, the individual distribution system and tank system itself. Now, let's ask a slightly different question here. Uh, since the only way up to this point, since the only way we know that we may have to diagnose a microbial problem is to look for certain signs, certain symptoms, uh, we have to ask what happens if you ignore those signs or what happens if those signs are appearing but you miss them, you don't see them, you don't recognize them for what they are. Um, what would you expect to happen? Um, the answer is, well, a lot of things can happen or develop if this is the case. Some of those things are related to the fuel. Some of them related to filters within the system. And some of them actually will happen to the tank itself. Now, for the fuel, if somebody just is not paying attention and doesn't do anything about a microbial problem developing in the, the tank and in the fuel, then eventually the fuel's characteristics are going to be changed. It's going to darken. It's going to form uh, gums and varnishes. It's going to stratify. And eventually the fuel is going to become unusable as it breaks down. Eventually it will fail a D975 test for something like water and sediment. So for the fuel, that can happen. Um, if you allow microbial problems to develop further, fuel lines and filters eventually will become plugged. For the tank, uh, you will see development of microbially induced corrosion damage. And that kind of thing, unfortunately, is not easy to see from the outside. You actually have to look inside the tank. You have to pull components to make sure this damage isn't happening. And there are certain components in the tank that are particularly susceptible to damage from microbes. Some of these things, water sensors and Vita root systems, including uh, parts of the, the Vita roots like the floats. Floats can get gummed up with biomass. Uh, sometimes even the specific gravity of the fuel, uh, if it gets bad enough, it will change and that will cause the water sensor and the Vita root to give an inaccurate reading. That is why we always say it's not a good idea just to rely, when you're keeping track of water, you don't want to just always rely on the automated readouts because there are many instances where the components uh, that, that help make that readout, those components are susceptible to being affected by microbial growth and you will get an inaccurate reading. So you always want to supplement your, uh, your, your, your automated water reading, so to speak, with just a good old visual check with something like water paste. So water sensors and Vita roots can, can be compromised. Uh, submersibles, what they call STP components. There was a study done, I wanna say probably about 10 years ago, a study done by the, the EPA that was trying to get a better handle on the effects of microbially induced corrosion in tank systems. And they concluded that the STPs were the most commonly damaged components by microbes in these tanks. So you've got those. And then you've also got damage to components above the vapor space. And this is due to what they call vapor space corrosion, which is a relatively new phenomenon. And when I say relatively new, I mean within the last, uh, let's say 10 years or so. And the way that this happens is there are microbes that are living and growing inside uh, in fuel storage situations. And these microbes produce acids. Um, and some of these acids are pretty small molecules. And they're small enough that they can be volatilized. They can actually 
go leave the fuel line they can go up into the vapor, be carried up into the vapor space, and they can then condense with water vapor in the air above the, the, the fuel. Um, and when that happens, you get liquid acid that's condensing on metal parts and corrosion will develop. Again, it's not something that you can see from the outside. You have to look, you have to check on these things. And, but yet it's one of those things that they have found will happen if you miss the signs or if you're not paying attention to the possible signs of uh, a microbial contamination problem developing. All of these things are things that you eventually you will see if you don't check the fuel and you allow a microbial growth situation to progress unchecked because you didn't know that it was there. So the next thing we want to talk about is, okay, well, how do you diagnose a problem? Um, and then what do you do about it? Well, for maintaining storage tanks and maintaining stored fuel inside storage tanks, Bell Performance has used a, a what we have called at times, we call it a three-pronged hybrid approach. The hybrid approach to fuel management is what, what it's called. It's those three prongs are chemicals, mechanical, and testing. And the rationale is that in order to do the best job of managing your fuel, you need to have all three of these things. And if you happen to be missing any one or two of those things, it's going to be a problem. You're not going to be doing, you're not going to be able to do it anywhere near as well as you should. So the third part of the approach, the testing part, that is where many people miss out because um, when they're monitoring for microbial problems, um, it's something that, you know, there's a number of reasons why they, they don't do testing. And if you're not actually testing for microbes, then if the question is, how do I diagnose a problem? If you're not doing a test to confirm uh, whether the problem exists and the extent of the problem, then the best that you're, you're basically stuck with relying on looking for those symptoms that we were talking about earlier. Not doing testing also makes it really difficult to do any kind of trend analysis or to determine those control intervals we talked about earlier. So testing is something that's really something that is part of the best practice of managing this whole situation. So control intervals, let's talk a little bit about those. Not something, we mentioned it a couple of times up to this point. Um, so if you manage a, if you manage some fuel, if that's part of your professional responsibilities, um, if, if you're doing that, then one thing that's useful to know is what's called your control interval. Control interval basically means how long your system can go before it can be expected to develop microbial problems. So similar to what we were just talking about a minute ago, remember we said uh, when, when we asked the question, how long does it take for these things to happen? And we said, it depends. We said every system and every tank is a unique environment. Um, they're different and they're unique in a number of key ways, not only with respect to things like what kinds of microbes can grow and thrive in them and cause problems, um, also not only with respect to what level of microbial contamination needs to be there in order for either minor problems or serious problems to show up, but also each tank and system is different in how quickly these microbes grow in a particular tank and how quickly they grow or reach the level needed to cause those problems. So each tank and each system is different. And that is another reason why you should do regular microbial testing, but you need to do it with a test method that's quantitative enough that you can use the results to establish numerical trends that are easy to interpret. And when we say quantitative enough, what we mean is the best uh, microbial test method for doing this is one that will give you a number. It will say, this is how much you've got. Um, that contrasts with microbial tests that they will do things like they will, they, they will change color 
for example. And you use the interpretation of the color. They may give you a, a key to look at the color. You know, this one is kind of orange, matches that kind of orange, and that means it's this many. Well, that's okay, but not anywhere near as good as a microbial testing method that generates a number. So that's what you want to use. So given these consider all these considerations, um, what kind of microbial testing is good to do? Preferably, first of all, preferably you want to use something you can do yourself instead of having to send a sample elsewhere. Reason is, is that um, we would say, first of all, quicker results are more accurate. What we mean is that um, the shorter amount of time from when you pull a sample to when you test it, the shorter that time is, the more accurate your results are likely to be. Um, and also, the more you have to handle samples and the longer time in between testing, the greater the variance between your results and the actual microbial levels is likely to be. In other words, you're much more likely to get a, a as, as accurate a result as you're likely to get if you can do the test like right there, a few minutes after you draw your sample, or if you can do it on site, you know, an hour later, rather than the alternative, which is you have to take the sample, send it off to a lab, and then have them wait like a week before they get around to testing the sample. And by that point, there's probably going to be a pretty large variance in the microbes that show up in the test versus the actual number of microbes that were in the sample uh, when you started. So the kinds of tests that you can do where you're at are what we would call in-field tests. And there are a number of different kinds of in-field tests that if you look for it, you will find these out there and they are readily available for you to get. Um, there are several different types. There are the culture tests, Micromonitor 2, culture dip slides, Liquid cult, these are readily available, but because of what we were just talking about, they have somewhat limited utility for what we're trying to do here. What we recommend uh, is ATP testing, uh, specifically ATP bifiltration is the name of the test method. ATP testing gives you the benefit of a numerical answer, and that is because the test is measuring ATP in a sample, and the amount of ATP is a direct correlation to the number, actual number of microbes that you've got. Um, that's much better in terms of accuracy and meaningfulness of results than if you have to get results by using a culture test that requires you to regrow microbes from your sample over a period of time. Uh, ATP testing is also a pretty quick test to do, so you can get your results right there and then make decisions if you need to. The downside for ATP testing, because when we did an episode before on the types of microbial tests, we, we always make it a point to point out that not everything is 100% good, 100% bad. There are good and bad points to anything that you look at, and anybody who tells you otherwise isn't being honest. The downside with ATP tests is it has an expensive upfront cost which may not make it best for a small operator. However, if you are a small operator, and so now you're like, well, I can't use what they're telling me is the best. If you are a small operator, um, what, you, the, what you can do is there are test submission kits, and the test submission kit would be, it would be a box that has the, the materials inside of it that have everything that you need to for you to take a sample that you pulled, package that sample, the postage is already shipped, it gets shipped as quickly as it can to the lab, and the test is run within minutes, you get a report back. That's Even though that's not as quick as doing it on site, that's still faster than a number of the other alternatives. Um, so now we're to the point, okay, we've talked about the fact that you need to do ATP, well, you need to do testing and preferably ATP testing in order to help diagnose if you've got a microbial problem. And so now let's say we're at the point where we've done microbial testing in our situation. What, we've done it, we get results back, 
that are in a form that help us know what we need to do next. And what I mean, what I mean by that is um, test results themselves don't mean anything. They're just numbers. The value of test results is whether they're able to tell you that you do or do not need to do something as a result. So in the case of ATP testing, for example, you'd normally, you would get a result back that, said, that says something like, you have a certain measured amount of ATP per milliliter of sample. And typically it would be reported back in these units of measure called picograms, which are basically like a one millionth of a gram, so to speak. So you might get a result back that says you have 10 picograms per milliliter of ATP was detected in your sample. The amount of ATP that you have correlates directly with the microbial levels in there. But a result that just says 10 picograms of ATP, that doesn't have that much use in and of itself. It's just a number. What is more useful, however, is if you can know for your given situation that a result of 10 picograms or 20 or 5 or 500, that that kind of result is a, a, a level of ATP and a level of microbial presence that is correlated with enough microbial presence that causes problems such that you need to do something or to take action. Now, in other words, to make it more simple, basically, 10 picograms doesn't mean a result of 10 picograms on a microbial test doesn't mean anything unless you know that when 10 picograms of microbial activity is in your system, you're starting to get corrosion damage. So if you got a result of 10, you'd say, well, we need to do something because that probably means corrosion is happening in our, in our system because we have data that shows a relationship between that level of microbial presence and this kind of problem developed. So if you do microbial testing, like ATP testing, over a period of time in your system, you can develop trends. And these are trends that will show how the microbial levels in your tank or in your system change or rise over a period of time. And then you can use that to correlate or develop a, or to see if there are any relationships between those levels of microbes that are changing over time and specific problems that may developing, like filter plugging at this point, STP corrosion was detected here, and here's the microbial levels that were associated uh, in the fuel when we found that problem. You can start to see the relationships between those. And that means you can now know that in the future that if you do a result and it comes back with a specific result, like let's say 20 picograms, you can know if that's enough of a problematic level that something needs to be done, or if it's something that means you're still good and you don't need to do anything. Being able to do that is a really, really valuable thing. It's one of the value po points of doing this kind of testing. So the results you get uh, will have their maximum usefulness if you have past information from your system like trend data, like correlations that tell you whether certain levels of ATP measured in your system mean that a problem is there or is coming or is not there. And this kind of site specific trend data can be really useful. And it will show, one of the things that it shows and implies is this thing that we've mentioned a couple times before, that each system is a little bit different. And that the fact that each system is different, that impacts for the results that you get, it impacts what those results mean for you in terms of what you need to do. See, the significance of microbial results are also specific to the medium being tested as well. This, I think, is the last point that uh, we're going to make on this. Um, uh, an example of this, uh, what we really mean here is um, in terms of how high or what level results have to be in order to predict that a problem is happening for you. So let's give you an example of this. Um, 
So we tend to see uh, when we test in a tank, we test fuel and we might test the free water phase that's alongside the fuel. We might do microbial tests in both of those. And what we see is that there are usually much higher microbe levels living in the free water than there are in the fuel. What that means is the number of microbes that you would need to see in the water in order to, to trigger the, hey, we've got a problem alarm, that number is actually much, much higher than the number of microbes that you would need to see in fuel in order to expect the same kind of problem. Um, if, you're, if you do a test of in the water and you get a reading of 50 picograms, a, a reading of 50 picograms per milliliter in water might not be associated with problems. But if you got the same result after testing fuel, that could definitely be uh, it's something that would be associated with problems. Now, all this being said, it's great if you happen to have or are able to develop historical testing data such that you can answer these kind of questions. You can know what a test result in the present means for avoiding problems based on what you've seen happening in your system in the past. It's great if you've reached that point where you can do that. But for the vast majority of people, they don't have this kind of data for their systems. They have to rely on generalized observations that is pulled from data that is kind of agglomerated from hundreds and thousands of systems all across the country. Um, and what this does is this, this speaks to developing the, the, the action point, the point at which if you get this result, it means you're going to have to take action. When we do testing, because we do testing for certain entities around in our area in Central Florida, and when we do testing, we tend to test fuel mostly. Sometimes we will test the water, but fuel is the most common, stored fuel is the most common thing that we test. We use a cutoff of 100 picograms per milliliter of an ATP result from the fuel as telling us or defining the difference between moderate microbial contamination level and severe microbial contamination level. That is what we use for regular stored fuel. But if you were to change environments and you were to go up to, let's say, North Dakota, and you were to do tests on, tests on drilling fluids used in the, the oil and gas industry, the oil and gas industry has been doing ATP testing for a long time, and they do a lot of it. They do millions upon millions of dollars of ATP tests. Um, and what they will find is that um, a result of 100 picograms per milliliter would be nothing to them because for their specific situation, uh, they can start seeing microbial counts in the millions before they need to worry about it. So it just so happens that in a drilling situation for them, the equipment being used and the environment being worked in can tolerate much, much higher microbial levels for longer periods of time before problems arise. And so like we've been saying, each situation is different. And the true meaning of a certain result needs the context of what has been proven to be a problem in the past. And the only way that you can know that is if you do testing and develop data over time. So we've now reached the point where, whether it's through testing, or through some other kind of confirmation. We believe that we do actually have a microbial contamination problem that we need to do something about. The question is what to do to get rid of that microbial problem. All this time that we've spent in this episode uh, talking about all the things related to this, all that's been building up to this point. So in terms of what to do, there are at least three big things, three essential steps that go into effectively knocking out microbial contamination. You've got to, number one, you've got to get any water out of the system. Number two, you've got to clean out any biomass from the tank that you're able to find. And then number three, you've got to apply biocide to the fuel. So let's talk about these. First thing, removal of water, the first important element for fixing a microbe problem. 
See, microbes need it's and this is this is well known within the industry. Microbes need free water present in order to grow or thrive. They don't need very much free water, but they do need it. Uh, I've heard it uh, described where um, you may have a layer of free water <clears throat> on the bottom of the tank that could be an eighth of an inch, which is not detectable by water paste. It's smaller than the amount that can be detected by water paste. And if you have a microbe living in that eighth of an inch, in terms of size, um, because microbes are so small, uh, that would be like a, a microbe in an eighth of an inch of water would be like a microbe looking up at Mount Everest standing at the bottom. There's that much difference between them. So you do not need very much water for microbes to do what they need to do. Microbes need that water to be there, however. We also know, so we know that, we also know microbes in storage tanks tend to grow best not the only places they grow, but they tend to grow best in two certain places in storage tank situations. Number one is they tend to grow really well in and behind biofilm formations on tank surfaces inside the tank. We'll talk more about that later, but that's place number one. Place number two is they like to grow in or near the interface between the layer of the fuel on top and the free water on the bottom. And that is why oftentimes, if you're able to look at a cross section of a tank that has a fuel layer and a free water layer, many times what you will see, if you can see the interface between the two layers, many times what you'll see is you'll see this stuff that's floating at that interface. Looks like, well, could look like any number of things, but that is what's commonly called rag layer. And that is microbial biomass that has been produced by the microbes living in that area. And the microbes will live in that rag layer. They will then pull elemental nutrients from the fuel and from the water. Um, and they'll grow and replicate and get bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, something else that you might also see in these situations is that, again, if you are able to look at a cross section and see the fuel on top, and the water on the bottom, sometimes what you'll see is you'll see different layers of what we call microemulsion near that interface. Microemulsions are, of course, they're suspensions of tiny, tiny, what we'll call, we'll call nano droplets, tiny nano droplets of water that are held in place in fuel by biosurfactants produced by the microbes. And they give kind of a hazy, um, cloudy appearance. And so these microbes will create these microemulsions. And what the microemulsions do is they actually enable the microbes to use that almost like platforms to travel further up into the fuel layer to pull what they need. So those are some of the kinds of things you see in the fuel. And so Having considered all that, having recognized that those things are in there, part of any proper microbial remediation process, the first part is finding and getting rid of whatever free water you can. The principle being that any water that you're not able to remove, any water left behind, can then be used by microbes in the future to simply continue the problem after you thought you were done in the first place. So you want to get as much of that free water out as you can. So what would you do? Well, what we would recommend first is you need to try and find out how much water is in there. And to do that, the best way to do, to do that is you use water finding paste. You take a tank stick and anyone who has managed storage tanks knows exactly what I'm talking about. It's a big long stick, usually marked with uh, uh, measurements, put water finding paste on the stick, water finding paste being something that it's a paste goes on usually like gold colored. And when it comes into physical contact with water, it changes color, turns red. So you put water finding paste on there, you lower the stick down to the bottom. And then typically if there's an inch of water on the bottom, it's going to turn that first inch of water finding paste. It's going to turn it red. You pull it up, you look, you see an inch of red, you've got an inch of free water in that tank. Uh, one thing you can do 
at this point is you can use a chart, a tank chart specific to your tank's make and size to calculate the volume of water that, that those number of inches refers to. Not everyone does that, but that is something that you can do. The next thing that you're going to do then, now that you have determined to some effect how much water you've got in there, is you're going to want to pump out as much of that water as you can get. This is a mechanical process. And if your tank is of a reasonably large size and you have an inch of water, you might remove 40, 50 gallons of free water, maybe more. So you pump out as much water as you can. But having, having done that, even when you think you're done, you, you have to know that there are still going to likely be pockets of water left behind in that tank, especially if the tank design involves anything like baffling elements in there. There's going to be at least a little bit of water left behind. And remember, we said microbes don't need very much water at all in order to restart the process. And so what are you going to do? Are you going to leave those trace pockets of water in there? Well, ideally, no. What you're going to do then is, after you have mechanically taken out whatever water you can, you can then add a water scavenging chemical to the fuel circulate it in and what that will do is that will find these trace pockets of water and it will absorb them back up into the fuel so that now you really have gotten as much of that water as you can. This kind of water scavenging chemical is something that you can use alongside any other chemicals that you're going to use later in the process. But it is something that a lot of people use to mop up that last little bit of water. So this is the first step removal of as much of the water uh, uh, as possible. And that is where we're going to leave off uh, with this episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. Uh, this is the end of part one. In part two, we're going to talk about steps two and three in the, uh, the, the idea of what are the best practices, things that you have to do in order to solve and eliminate a microbial problem in your tank. So we're going to talk about the cleaning up of the, the tank in terms of removal of biomass and biofilm, why you need to do that. And then we're going to talk about what are the chemicals you need to add. Specifically, there's one kind of chemical that even if you use nothing else, there's one chemical that you have to use in the third step of the process, which is the essential thing in this entire thing. Even if you didn't remove any water, even if you did not remove any of the biomass, if you don't do add this one chemical, you will not get rid of your microbial contamination problem. So we're going to talk about that as well. So this is the end of part one. Thank you very much for joining me for this episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. Uh, we would appreciate it if you haven't done already. If you would subscribe on your favorite podcast platform, iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, any of those. If you haven't done already and you feel so inclined. If you like what you heard, by all means, leave us a good review because reviews are very important. And of course, as always, all the important stuff for this episode are going to be that you will find information on those things in the show notes. So until next time, I am Eric Bjornstead, your guide through the ever-changing world of fuel. Please join us next time for the next episode of the Fuel Pulse Show podcast. 